Hey everybody, it's Mark Wilbank here from Haunted Auckland and Paranormal New Zealand. Welcome to another episode of Outside the Box. And today's episode, we're going to be talking to Kat and Jose from Australian paranormal research group, Spirit. And they're based in Victoria, Australia. So, uh, are you there? Ah, uh, shit. Jose's obviously gotten caught up in the KFC drive through or something. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, well, me, I don't know when I'm going to be working again at the moment. My entire department lost their job due to this virus, so I don't know when I'm going to be working again at the moment, but but on the plus side, that's allowed me to contemplate moving up to my favorite little country town and and being closer to my my favorite little location at the moment, so cool. I can't say it. It's not entirely a negative, but but yeah, well, very much still it is. I don't like to not work, and and the world's just gone mad at the moment, and I don't like that it's keeping me away from getting back out there doing stuff within the field again. You know, I was I was very much enjoying. Well, I was very much enjoying. The fact that I have had for like two and a half years now, I've been lucky enough to have access to this awesome big old country pub in Euroa. And there's been some weird stuff go on there. And no one's actually allowed to stay overnight there except the staff and me. So mm. I've been very, very lucky that I've had these last few years to to actually sort of go about and gather data and sort of correlate readings and and try to learn about people to learn more about the history of the place and and just sort of immerse myself in it all. It's been great. Mm. So yeah. You know, I'm I'm kind of I'm missing that I'm not getting to do a great deal with that with the team at the moment. I can still do that solo, but even though we're all as different as chalk and cheese, I still I still miss my team. Because oh, yeah. yeah, you know they're they're kind of family, you know. Yeah. Oh you you can get quite close to your team. I'm I'm quite close to my team as well and uh um, we're quite lucky. We, we sort of went into level one, and so we're able to sort of get out there and do things now. But we have heard rumours now that um, they're contemplating taking it back to level four again, where everybody is stuck in their homes. So uh, we're not too sure what's going on at the moment. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, really, there. I have to wear a mask everywhere from tomorrow. So we're nearly at that stage four thing. We never went back from, we never went back further than stage three, really. We never went, we never went much further back than that. Right. Yeah, we went to level four all the way back and everything was shut down. And um, then it sort of clicked back up. It's back going up to me. But um, and I've heard rumors that they're, that's going to be going back to four again. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Interesting times. Yeah, well, given given what I read today, I read something today on um. There's this page on. Well, we're recording, but you can cut this out anyway, can't yeah. you? But there's so there's this page on Facebook that I look at sometimes, and it's called "I Fucking Love Science." Mm. And they had something up today, and apparently there is a couple of. Of actual now that they're talking that the whole thing may be actually moving around with all the bacterium and all the viruses and things that can get around like up in the jet stream somewhere like way up yeah as in as in this shit can just be blown about by the wind and I don't know. There's so much false information out there at the yeah. moment, and there's so much panic. I don't know what to believe. But if 
that's the case if it turns out that those studies can be replicated and can and they can actually get some data on that well it basically means that well to me it all it means that we're basically screwed anyway <laughs> right. you know people are going to get it people are going to get it masks no masks yeah we're going right. to get it i don't believe anything i read on the news or hear on the news now i just sort of just what can you do? It's out of our hands. Whether it's a real thing, no. or whether it's faked, whether it's uh, yeah, whatever, we can't do anything about it. So. No, I'm just for. I'm waiting for the same stuff or in the paranormal world. You know, I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for academic studies, and I'm waiting for stuff that can be peer reviewed, and I'm waiting for fact figures and and. Before I make up my mind on anything, I kind of, you know, I'd like to know that there are at least a whole shitload of really, really smart people out there that have actually come up with all of that stuff. You know? It's a trust thing, isn't it? You've got to trust people that you're not being lied to. So, I don't know. well, and I guess that's the thing. To, I, I'm I'm not I'm not completely the infallibility of science. I know it has its flaws and its faults, but at the same time, really, we've gone off it for a really really long time now, and and we rely on the facts and figures that, that these guys give us. So once someone reputable enough says something, then yeah, I think that's what I'm waiting for. I'm just waiting for someone that's actually got the real the real know how to to sort of say, Okay, this is what's going on, this is the numbers. Yeah. I don't I don't trust much of what I read in the news at all and I'm seeing so many people putting up this false just yeah. There's so much conspiracy theory bullshit going on. Where did this 5G stuff come from? <laughs> I don't know. Again, we can't control it. We can't have it. You know, we have no say. So we just have to roll with it, really. Yeah. Wherever it takes us. Yeah. Here we go. Here comes my class clown. There it is. Right. Have you got your microphone on, man? He's just gone so, off now, so... Oh, no! Jose, come on! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, might, I might just have to talk to you. Tortures. We're already there already, anyway. He tortures, he tortures me sometimes. He really does. Okay. I can wait on... I can go to the... Web. I can... Oh, there okay. we go. I'm just trying to i'm telling him to allow audio video in case he missed the prompt because can you see and hear me you, uh, jose can you see me and hear me no he can't hear or see me i don't think he can hear me he's looking blankly at me on the screen i think he can see me maybe There's some there's some interference going on, so I'm guessing he's trying to join in somehow. Yeah, he's trying. He looks a little bit frustrated. I take it you can't hear me, Jose. No. No. Bloody Australians. Safe drive. Yes, yeah. I think. Oh, I got him. I can hear you. Yay, Ellie. Fucking Lulia. Hey! There what the he hell is. happened there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yay! Little golf, little golf clap for Jose here. <laughs> I think I lost a few more hair cells right here. You can see where I lost my hair again. See that? Just as well we weren't live. We might we might even get Jose's snoring dog in the background. 
Yeah. No, he's awake. If you hear a, if if you hear a weird noise, wait. Right wait for it. Him right there. Oh. It's not. It's not. It's not Rocky. You went on command. Would you do something? He's awake. Always do something right. Don't <laughs> snore yeah. when he's awake. Give me about five ten minutes and you hear him snoring. Cool. <laughs> Oh. So, okay, tell us about yourselves, um, the team, how you, know, how you both got into the paranormal field individually, and then how you came together as a team. I'm I'm going to let him go first on that because I've got a very, very, very long story around all of this. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Jose first so that he can explain how he got into this. And yeah, I can I can take it after he's done that. But Jose, you go first. Well, thanks for that, Kat. And um, <laughs> then, uh, I only got thirty percent battery, so lucky I'm going first. I got my charger in right now because Kat will never shut up. So, um, <laughs> um, I hear you, man. Uh, you so, how did I get into this? Um, well, I was. When I was a kid, I was always interested in paranormal, what was going on, because when I had my first experience, that kind of like put up alarm bells, like, what's going on? How is this possible? Et cetera, et cetera. So when I actually first really got into it was approximately about five or maybe six years ago. I took my missus to um, Aradale, Lunatic Asylum, for her birthday. And Little did I know that what I was about to encounter me personally was just on a whole nother level. Um, so that really pricked my ears up and got me thinking what if and what's next and how and all the other stuff that comes with it. And with that, I guess, um, pretty much. <laughs> super, super path. Uh, so that was my path and how I started. And. Um, my very first investigation, like I said, was at Aradau as a guest. Um, and one of the investigators there basically told us that we're like magnets. And because I was hearing things, picking up things, um, stuff that wasn't even that they even knew about was going on. Mm. And I had EVPs that asked questions like, Did you guys hear someone say something? And then live playback on a recorder that I had, you could actually hear something. Like respond back to my question that I asked. So literally right then and then, I think I fell in love with it from right there, and I haven't turned my back on it since. I've heard a good, I've heard a good things about uh, a few good things about that place, eh, Aradale? Oh, you, you Aradale, um, uh, Aradale's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Aradale is in a, is definitely a place you need to go to. Um, not for the faint-hearted. Um, and definitely one place that um, I use my partner uh -oh. right now because um, she's a nurse. So I use her as a light in pretty much everywhere we go now. So um, I'm a bit of a prick that way, but at the same time, we get so much interaction with what is around. And I wouldn't say the ghosts or whatever because there's no definite indication that it is a ghost it's more the um what if or what the hell I realize i got my broken finger on camera so excuse that so yeah. it's kind of hideous isn't it oh look at that wow <laughs> you're free kind of good isn't it look at that. oh that's nasty that's the other half i'm the guinea pig Hi, darling. <laughs> Hi, Kat. Yeah. So, yeah, excuse that finger. So, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> like Jose, I had an interest from a very young age, but I had somewhat slightly more unusual reasons for having that interest. So, my mom, um, rest in peace, Ma. My mom when I was younger used to work as used to do work for the Victorian Spiritualist Union 
Um, so spiritualism, of course, being that whole movement that was founded back in the 1800s by the Fox sisters, etc., etc. So out here in Victoria, we have a few spiritualist churches, and of course, they formed unions. So my mom used to do work as a medium for the Victorian spiritual at my grandmother's house from about, I mean, it might have even been before I was around four or five, but I would have been too young to remember, of course. But part of my childhood involved attending weekly communication circles, as in the old school ones with the medium cabinet and the spirit trumpet and and the recorders going in the background and all of the sitters. And so I kind of grew up with it all. Um, some, and I'm not going to say once again that it's necessarily due to my mom having done all of this, but here and there during my childhood, it seemed like some weird things happened in my house. I um, I actually write a blog. I wrote a post once explaining about some of those bits and pieces. And I kind of just grew up with this strange stuff with, you know, little random noises and things sort of being moved around in my house with no nobody having moved them with their own two hands or anything like that. So. I sort of grew up with all of this. Um, I got into the I got into the investigating side of things probably a little over twenty years ago now. I um, I'd always had an interest and I knew I wanted something to do with it, but I had no clue that they even called the paranormal investigator at that stage. I had no clue. I didn't have the internet. <laughs> you know, I wasn't very up on all of this, and I hadn't done a great deal of reading about it then. Um, around 20 years ago, I was working in the kitchen at, well, not that it matters, but I was working in the kitchen at an aged care home somewhere down here on the, on the peninsula where I live. And one of my co-workers, knowing that I was into all of this stuff, bought me in a newspaper article about a couple of guys that actually went out and did exactly what I wanted to do. They went out and explored historic locations with reputations for unusual happenings. And they, they did that, that, yeah, they did so very well. So I thought, and that article just completely piqued my interest. Um, cue a very nervous 24 year old me and an email across to the leader of that little team, which was called Paraquest. Uh, the leader's name was Gary Sullivan. And little nervous 24 year old me sent him across a very, very, very impassioned and lengthy email explaining how this was what I wanted to do and that I never knew that there were people that did this and how would I go about doing this and could he help and long story short I ended up working with Gary and learning from him and well I still learn from him but it was about six years ago that that I actually started this team I decided it was time for me to try and get out there and put some of what I've learned into practice with my own team and see if I could pass some of it on too because Gary always taught me to pay it forward, you know, share what you know. So it was about six years ago that I started the team and it was about, Jose, how long ago now? Three years? Uh, you and I together? Um, well, when uh, I first met you, uh, yeah, you met me, uh, that's a long four, years ago. four years ago, four years ago, four years ago, I met him at Geelong jail and he was one of the tour guides then and uh, uh, I was uh, 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 not tour guide investigator. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, there was a distinction. 
He was one of the he was one of the team at Geelong Jail, one of the investigators. I met him and we basically just sort of hit it off straight away and we found something similar in our mindset and in our approach and in our pasts. And um, yeah, when I had a previous incarnation of my team, about three years ago, your dog snoring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a previous incarnation of my team about three years ago, and when that incarnation fell apart, my first choice for people that I wanted to have on board to help rebuild the team and get things started again, my first choice was Jose and Kim, and they've been part of things ever since. Naturally, right? right? <laughs> He's very modest, as you can tell. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So you, you've been through, you've investigated quite a few locations over that way then? And... We've yeah, got... um, yep. a few locations, I'd say. Cat uh, is done more than I have, though. Jose, having been, because Jose did uh, and still does a lot of work with Twisted History, with our friend Deb Robinson and the crew over there, Jose spends a lot of time at some certain locations. I, um, he's very lucky. Uh, Geelong Jail is Jose's sort of main home. But with the team, we've been to we've been to a few places. At the moment, everything's on hold. I think we've done some we've done some decent stuff. Um, it's always it always seems to be a thing with investigators that you want to go to those bucket list places, right? You know, you want to go to the big ones. You want to go to Monte Cristo or Mayday Hills or Aradale or this jail or that jail and i can say that with the team we've actually been very lucky to have visited all of those places cool. um me myself yeah i've possibly been on a few more with the previous incarnation of the team um i tend to prefer to where i can i'd really like to do a little more in the way of spending a lot of time at one location as in i have loved the overnighters that we have done at various places um monte cristo for instance was amazing um the place was amazing we've had we've had some great times elsewhere as well we were lucky enough to be the first team to um get to spend a night in gundagai jail as well which was a little scary because funnel web spider. <laughs> but, you know, it was still great fun. Um, we also had the privilege of spending a lot, a lot of time at Old Castle Moon Jail before it was privately sold and then got closed to everybody and now nobody can get in there. But I tend to like, I tend to like spending a lot of time repeatedly it's oh yeah sure. i think it's important to read those places as many times you can. and a greater correlation with experiences and oh technical difficulties yeah, a, little bit of, a little bit of freezing there absolutely yeah. Yeah, we went, there was a buzzing noise for a second. I had to pause there. I'm not sure what was going on. <laughs> the Zoom stuff is very strange. But so we visited a few places together. Um, definitely more, definitely more on the books, but of course everything's on hold at the moment. And I really would like as much as I can to get us Just up the label to visit there again. And it, yeah, you know, you, you have that you have that greater amount of data upon a place because you can make up mind about a place from one night. You can't just say, yeah, it's haunted or no, it's not. And sometimes you can't even do that anyway. But I like to spend a lot of time just 
yeah, revisiting places as much as I so I'd like to have that for us. Um, I think it's important. If you much more on the books. Can do it. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to get repeat visits, I think it's important to, to take them. Eventually. Eventually, when we can again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's right. It's but, right. yeah. We've, um, we've, we've had some great experiences together as a team. Um, Kim got slapped in the head one time. I scared the hell out of her. It wasn't from me. Let me just put that out there. It was not from me. <laughs> Sorry, that came out wrong. I should have mentioned that Kim's sort of the, aside from myself, who's sort of the, I'm getting a lot into the research and study side of things these days. Um, and I'm proud SPR member and even got the tattoo to prove it and can't even see that. There we go. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm getting a bit more into the research and study side of things. Yeah? Your arm is that white. It looks like you're holding up a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a redhead, dear. How is it supposed to look other than white? <laughs> yeah, I got nothing. So, <laughs> so, so early, man. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going there, man. That's just too easy. No. <laughs> Thank you. But, so, what, what, so would you guys, what would you guys say is the most demanding part of being a paranormal investigator? Uh, for me personally? Yeah. Um, okay, well... Um, we've gone that's, some great that's distances. That's a pretty open Yeah. Yeah, distances... And also, I would... I think, yeah. yeah. I think the main demanding thing is, as a team's perspective, is trying to get everybody on board at the same time and uh, organized. And I think yeah. that being punctual and having a structured set plan before you uh, actually investigate is critical because there's no point setting up equipment at like three o'clock in the morning when you've only got an hour left to investigate. Um, hence why I'm constantly telling a certain somebody to shut up and keep moving. Um, who will man? Um, so I think demand wise is probably travel and getting the team together in one location at one set time um, but once we do that and get a game plan happening it's just it's go time hmm. for me I was going to say firstly the travel is definitely a hard thing sometimes for instance to to get to Monte Cristo it was basically well it was a two day road trip for us wasn't it um, as in it was, as in it was we, a five hour trip for me oh, oh. something happened there it was it was a very long road trip get there and so sometimes the travel and the related to that can be difficult and like Jose said yeah um the team's the team's grown a lot now just to digress a little bit here um the team has grown a lot now when when the team first started out there was only there was only six of us and We've taken on uh, a couple of learners. We've taken on a couple of learners now. So there's now 10 people in the team. Um, as Jose said, it is difficult sometimes to try and coordinate everybody and get them all in the one place at the one time at the same time. Um, and sometimes it's, it can be difficult to try and coordinate everyone so that we can carry out a structured investigation. Um, you know, it's sort of, I don't like to treat it like a military operation, but in a way it sort of has to be as, there has to be a little bit of, sort of a little bit of, as people here, as, here and and sometimes it can within a specific time frame. 
Actually, I will have to serve the other. There goes the dog again. Speaking personally, I would have to say the other difficult thing for me has been a little bit just trying to, because there's a lot of different beliefs from, everybody has their own belief system. We all have our own values, assumptions, beliefs, expectations. So trying to make sure that those can still all sort of work harmoniously together has been really difficult, but interesting, I would say. Um, yeah. And, and aside from that, the other thing would be environmental conditions here and there. You know, you go to places and sometimes it's freezing cold and I can remember nights in, I can remember in Castle Main Jail where it was about minus two degrees and we were all practically dying from hypothermia. And sorry, that was probably, we actually weren't really, but it was very cold. Um, environmental conditions can be difficult sometimes, especially when you're in a location for only one accustomed to the environment you're working in and the various effects that it might have upon your perception and things as well and yeah there we go gadgets let's talk gadgets all right um i'll make this quick so my favorite piece <laughs> sorry my favorite piece of equipment would possibly be myself um, That's a, yeah i think you're possibly the best sense of equipment going around. Um, your gut instincts, your your senses. Your, yes, your eyes can deceive you sometimes, but just relying on your own personal self is probably the best piece of equipment that I can use. Um, I don't like to use equipment and say it's all 100% accurate and say, yes, we are communicating with something because probably not. You know, it could be an EMF spike somewhere that triggers something off. So would I say every single gadget is 100% accurate? No, I wouldn't. Um, exactly right. Do we like the bells and whistles when the lights go on and off? Yeah, we do. But then leads into another conclusion. What's causing it? Hence why we debunk everything before we can even like remotely think that it is paranormal. So well, it um, should be. that's my answer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the way it should be. Way it should not everything be. is paranormal. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Kit, how about you? Exactly. Mm -hmm. My favorite equipment, I would have to agree with Jose, would probably be myself. I like to have a, I like to have something that I can write stuff down on. Um, you know, I think when it comes to recording experiences or things like that. Because our memories can so easily trick us, I think it's great to have something where you can just straight off the bat have that recorded so it's there for later, so you can go back and look at it. Yeah. Um, I am very, I am very fond of audio. I do like to use audio a lot. There is not any proof whatsoever that anything that anyone has ever recorded on audio ever in the history of audio recording is actually electronic voice phenomenon but you never know and it's also very handy to have that and maybe a bit of video as well just to also track the movement of the team to be able to know okay so there was this noise but was was there a team member in the area at the time was there somebody in the room you know what was going on aside from what was recorded yeah so i do tend to yeah. think that's important yeah i have to say your answer is way more refreshing to hear than so many other answers i've heard from so many other teams um I i'm not even going to mention the word k2 meter <clears throat> no i didn't say that <laughs> can i get a what what uh can i get a what what <laughs> So many teams I've asked that question to, so many people through the years I've asked that question to, and they say spirit box or the connect, the connect camera are the oh. most important pieces of equipment because they gather the most amount of um, evidence. 
Yeah. And that's that's Don't judge. That's, that's, I don't that's like to judge, but uh, no, neither do I. I think the word evidence is very much a sticking point, though, because I don't believe there's actually any such thing. No. Um, a lot of teams like to use the word evidence. I don't. I prefer to call it an anomaly, or I like to call it unexplained. I don't understand the use of the word evidence because that implies something empirical and inarguable. And yeah, I have never quite understood the use of that word evidence. But yeah, um, Amazing, isn't it? yeah. well, that's me. <laughs> I've spoken to teams yeah. that pretty much their, their main source of their main piece of equipment is a spirit box. And they say they use it all the time because it gets the most amount of evidence. <laughs> so. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. What's your favorite? Out of curiosity, what's yours? Um, Gadget-wise, <laughs> video camera. Video camera. I just use video cameras for everything. My good old Sony video cameras, they've got everything I need. They've got good microphones, good clear quality uh, video. They've got night shot if you want to use the night shot uh, function. How do you feel about television, paranormal television shows and the way the paranormal research field is portrayed in the TV media? Is it a hindrance or is it a good thing? I wouldn't say that I believe everything 100% because especially when they say they go into a location by themselves, but clearly there's a video like, camera team with them. So you're kind of voiding your own statement that you go in there by yourself, um, which always cracks me up, by the way. I, I always think it's kind of hilarious. And it's usually um, the cameraman that throws the rock into the... Uh, that room <laughs> yeah because right at that point the camera kind of goes out of focus real quick so yeah um but we won't say nothing about that no 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 um we don't, we don't do do i think it's all real and is it 100 percent legit not at all um some things i see on tv and i question what are they thinking and, and others i question what is that that they're caught? Hmm. Um, so is it good for the field? I say it's probably good for entertainment value and keeping general interests. Um, possibly how I word this properly without offending anybody. Um, I won't be offended. Yeah. No, look, I'm just going to say it as it is. I offend everyone. I don't give a shit. Sorry for swearing. Um, oh. I think it's always like I think it's always you need to keep an open mind that this is TV they're there for ratings and um, like I said it's a, it's good for the public to see what investigators do but at the same time I think it's very important that these investigators are professional and keep it real and say what is uh the possibility of a debunking or what is actually happening not just for ratings like oh, i've got goosebumps can you feel this oh yes i can feel this too i'm like can you though or are you just mimicking what someone else is saying hmm. um so those kind of things are a little bit wishy-washy for me but like i said it's good entertainment value um i do like some of the gadgets that they use i think it's kind of hilarious with the type of responses they get and how they respond to things and um the fact that any type of equipment that they use on tv is always a yes like how do you interpret those responses as always being a yes to your question you can't so i don't understand how it's always definitive hmm. yeah that's true that's true how do you feel how do you feel the paranormal research field is going to move forward in the future because at the moment, I, I personally feel it's going a bit stale. That's my opinion. I think it's going a little bit oh, stale. Oh, definitely. Um, how do you think yeah, we can definitely. move forward? We need ideas. Um, I think by not sugarcoating things is probably the first thing. And just be genuine with, like, not only yourself, but to the audience or members of the public. Um, don't give them false hope. Mm. Um the 
the investigations that I partake in, in my, the public that I come with me, for example, I always tell them straight up, um, areas that you're going to get false positive readings. Um, you don't expect to capture a ghost or expect something to happen because it doesn't. No guarantee. Like if, yeah, exactly. So when I'm at Old Geelong Jail, for example, when I'm working there by Twisted History, um, shout out, hey, um, uh, I always guarantee, like, sorry, not guarantee, I always tell the my clientele that there's no guarantees. Now we're here for to investigate, but we're having a good time, yes. But at the same time, Xbot here is going to show a false positive reading, and I explain to them what is a false positive. Um, how lead paint can set off your objects that you have in your hand, or your equipment that you use. Um, so, in how it's going to move forward, to answer to your question, I think literally just being honest and just being legit. Don't sugarcoat it, because if you sugarcoat it, you get caught out. You're just going to tarnish the entire field, even more so than it probably already has been. I think I might have missed about three or four minutes there. My apologies. I don't know what happened. The entire computer just decided to die and I've just gotten it working again. Um, I gather the question was something about how does one feel the field is going to move forward? Yeah, yeah. Very good. How, 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 what, are your, yeah, what are your thoughts on how we can make it move forward? I personally think it's getting a bit stale. And we need to try some new ideas. Absolutely, indeed. I think I think a broader mindset is needed a lot in in this field. I think there's a lot to be considered in what we can learn from the people that have gone before us in the research that has been conducted in the past. I think there's a greater deal of knowledge needed around why some of the teams do what they do for instance why do we all run around in the dark waving this sort of hmm. why do we do that because it's fun there's a, lot of people, there's a lot of people out there that are not going to realize that it's basically all due to the work of one fellow called michael persinger um I think there is a lot of research and a lot more knowledge that needs to be accumulated throughout the field. Um, I think I think people, and my apologies to those that do enjoy the shows, the, the, re, the, the reality shows, my apologies to those people, but I think there is a lot of teams that still take their methodology and their thinking as being gospel, as being actual research and investigation when there's a lot more to be done behind the scenes exactly. i think um i think i actually i agree with something that i read not too long ago um i read an article by a, a lady called sharon hill um she's to be honest sometimes she's a little bit of a gorilla skeptic for my liking but at the same time, she does make some perfectly valid points. And she pointed out that even without use of just proper scientific method and research and peer review and all of that important stuff, that research and investigation groups can still contribute as what she called citizen scientists, as in what if everyone could actually gather data and figure out the correlates with that data you know what what is you know is there causation is there just correlation what correlates to what and if they could all contribute that somehow together i mean imagine if several teams go to the one location and they all get different data sets and they're there at different times and people have had different experiences and maybe some of the maybe some of the data might correlate to that imagine if that could all be added to one just one sort of a a, a database i suppose to, i think there needs people, to that's a lot of work to, to a lot of people it's too much effort it's much easier to switch your spirit box on 
and there's your evidence right there. That's all you need. <laughs> Absolutely, Automatic I know. Directly to the ghosts. That's all you need. That's, that's your research. That's yeah, because it's nothing to do. It's nothing to do with random. It's nothing to do with random radio noise or some dude out on the highway with a truck that might be on a CB radio. No, no, not at all. But I think there is a great deal more understanding that needs to be had um, of. Where, where, where we've all, where we all started, where we, where we've come from, um, because if you don't understand that beginning, then how do you move on from that? How do you keep providing? How do you keep providing momentum for that? Mm. Mm. You know, if all you go off is what Zach Bagans or. Nick Groff, or or um, what's that guy from Ghost Hunters? Uh, yeah, Jason something, Jason you know. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if that's all you go off is their investigation and their methodology, and you're not learning about that past, you're not learning about where the research has come from, and you're not. And I think there's another thing too. And sorry, I go off on tangents, and I do tend to talk quite a bit. And I'm pretty oh, sure. Fine. And I'm, yeah, I was going to say I'm pretty sure Jose probably filled you in on that whilst I was gone. Um, but yeah, I I think. That, uh, a much greater deal of research and understanding that needs to be that needs to be done. Um, mm. There I'd needs to be like a to greater. More reading. I'd like to see more, more people reading up. I want to see more people Sorry. reading books and and learning about their equipment instead of just grabbing a K two meter or a spirit box. Read about the spirit box. Read about why it was created. Read about how it works. Exactly. And how it came about, and where, did, and where did the theory on EMF come from? And and there is also, I think, there is a little bit of, there is also maybe got to be a little bit of acknowledgement from teams too that, as Jose has already said, um, and this is one of the reasons we get along so well together because he and I are similar in our beliefs that not everything is paranormal me i take it a little bit further because i've gone into that whole i'm not going to wave the lightsaber again you know but <laughs> i've gone into the whole spr thing and i'm learning a little bit more about the psychology behind things now and i'm learning a little bit more about the past of the field and i think there needs to be some acknowledgement from some teams that not everything is paranormal there's that whole well really there's two schools there there's survival theory and then you have telepathic theory so i think there needs to be a little bit of acknowledgement that just because something's happening sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean that it's survival theory it doesn't necessarily mean that you're talking to a ghost. It might, there might be going around telepathic theory. There is a very good possibility that we might be able to project these sorts of things ourselves. You know, when you look at things like the Philip experiment and the fact that it seems that people have effectively created their own ghosts. Now, what psychological correlates cause that? Mm. So, and that's going to be too much work for a lot of teams, though. I mean, Jose and myself over the years have both had some weird stuff happen. And so did Kim. She got slapped in the head at Monte Cristo. Yes! <laughs> oh, she's going to hit you for that. <laughs> but look, I, I have to let you guys know that Kim is possibly the most skeptical person on our team. And um, when she did get slapped at monte cristo a it was hilarious um b it was pure shock for her because to this day we cannot explain it hmm. i'm jealous i've never had anything like that happen to me so i'm always uh waiting well, oh, I got, come to geelong i got pinched on the ass i got pinched on the ass one time at castle in jail i suppose that counts yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> come come down to um, Old Geelong Jail and uh, go visit Ranga. He's an interesting character. Okay. Because, I mean, I've been all over the UK and I've stayed in some of the most haunted places over there by myself, you know, overnight. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Experienced nothing. Nothing, really? You know, well, it's just... I was... Back, but... Now I'm jealous. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, well, um, the reason why I say go visit this one particular cell or this individual entity or whatever you want to call it, um, one day I was at Old Geelong Jail just for some playtime, really. There's myself, Kim, and um, a fellow employee that used to work there, um, just showing her the ropes and just showing her what's going on. And we were walking towards known as the pedophile cell. And on the way up there, I was pretty much just haggling the known entity, if you want to call it that, who's residing in there, um, known as Ranga. And as I was doing that, you just heard this massive thud slap, skin on skin, to the point where everyone else around me heard me, like wince in pain, and I was hanging over the balustrades, and there was a clear handprint on my face. And it was actually, for once, it wasn't Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that was a pretty cool time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a pretty cool time. I'm still waiting. I'm, I'm being patient though. I'm forever patient. I haven't said that. I I was in my rookie days, and I was that like cowboy gunslinger going in and just abusing the crap out of anything and anything that was there. Mm. And I guess I copped it for it. And I've learned a lot since then. Mm. It's the best way, isn't it? Learning from experience and obs observation and just being in, being in the moment. I think it's the best way to be. Yeah. 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 All right, guys, I I'm think... sorry if you can hear my dog story. That's awesome. It's a great sound. It's very demonic. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Mark, meet Rocky, the snoring dog. Yeah, hang on. If I can work on how to flip my screen around. Uh, Don't do it. Don't hang on. Look at that. King Charles, is he? Is he That's King Charles? Snoring, don't you? Yeah. King Charles Cave, about four years old. Loud as hell. Look at that. Yeah, and that's my little dude. Nice. Awesome. All right. I think we've uh, done all we could do here. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. All right. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk again, again soon, sometime. We'll talk again soon and hopefully we'll get a better connection. But uh, this, is, this has been fun. I've enjoyed it. Cat, you're right. Cat. Cat. Yoo-hoo! Bye. We'll get going now, and I'll, I'll talk to you guys um, later on, okay? Um, uh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Like <laughs> oh, you say goodbye for me, uh, Jose. Bye. I will, man. I will. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. Catch, man. See you.